a familiar passage powerfully presented. Yet in his familiarity, we can at times lose sight of key important aspects that we should be picking up. I find that to be the case as I have the privilege to travel around the country, all over the world, talking about origins and creation. There are important aspects that people have failed to recognize at their peril. And I wonder if maybe that could be so for some of us here this morning as well. Perhaps we can fill in some of the gaps as we talk together and think together. When Bill Gates and Paul Allen founded Microsoft, they believed that though innovation in hardware would always be needed, the future of computing was in software. The creation of the computer not only required the chip technology to make motherboards work, it required the programming language to bring order to the functioning of those chips to accomplish a desired goal. Whatever else creation might be, it is an ordering activity. It has been understood as such since ancient times. Whether we think of order on the level of galaxies, the solar system, the human body, cells, the ecosphere, weather systems, the cycle of life, social institutions, or our lives and relationships. Bringing order is crucial to the act of creation. Our lives and existence are all bound up in the software of the cosmos, not just the hardware. Furthermore, we are not just carbon units. We are spiritually endowed people who bear the image of God. When we say that God created the world and all that is in it, we are not just saying that God has created the cosmic house that is our place of residence in this universe. Third rock from the sun a lesser planet in one of many solar systems located in the corner of one galaxy containing 300 billion other stars. And that galaxy, only one of 500 billion galaxies in our expanding universe. That always makes us feel rather insignificant. Such insignificance would be magnified if we only thought of ourselves as carbon-based units. It would be easy to conclude that ordering this vast universe of 7 times 10 to the 24th stars is a massive undertaking. We may, however, on reflection, consider that simple in, co in comparison to orchestrating the intricacies of the over 37 trillion cells in each human body. We are each a galaxy of cells unto ourselves, but it would be degrading and reductionistic to think of ourselves only in such materialistic terms. These houses of clay that we inhabit are only the beginning of what God has created us to be. More important than the fact that God made it all is the fact that he makes it all work. It's not enough to say that he has created material out of nothing. He has created meaning out of nothing. Anatomy without physiology results in an inert robot, a statue, a rag doll. Children recognize the distinction as they are delighted by the Pinocchio exclamation, I'm a real boy. As important as it is for us to endeavor to learn everything that we can about the house in which we live, whether cosmic or anatomical, we affirm that order and function are infinitely more important. When we say that God created the world and all that is in it, we are also saying that God has not only built a house for us, 
He has made a home for us. When Jesus told his disciples in the upper room that he was going to prepare a place for them, we must recognize that it was not the first time that he did that. For the first time, we have to read Genesis 1. Furthermore, whenever he is making a place for us, he is making a place for himself. We learn that also in John 14 when he states the reason that he was preparing a place. In order that you may be where I am. When we study scripture, we learn that from the beginning it was God's desire to order the cosmos as sacred space where he can relate to us. The cosmos is sacred because he is here. And our history is the story of his desire to be in relationship with us and the steps he has taken to accomplish that. When he made us in his image, he enlisted us to participate in the world that he was ordering. He did not bring us into a perfectly ordered world, but into an optimally ordered world with the idea that we would participate with him in the continuing process of bringing order, of creating. When we were given the task of subduing and ruling, we were not given license to exploit or abuse God's world. We were entrusted with the stewardship of managing what belonged to God and finding ways to bring more order in it. God created us to be order-bringing creatures. Human creativity is the fulfillment of that mandate. Whether our creativity is expressed in industry or technology, in medicine or in scientific discovery, in artistic masterpieces or musical compositions, such activity brings order to our world and to our lives. Our response to being engaged in such God-enabled activities should be similar to that expressed by Olympic medal winner Eric Liddell, who said, when I run, I feel his pleasure. The full range of the liberal arts exposes us to the many ways that we engage in bringing order to our world and to our lives. The Bible commends the path of wisdom to us, God created in wisdom. Indeed, wisdom was the first of his creations. His wisdom in creation is seen most prominently in the order that he established. In fact, biblical wisdom is not associated primarily with intelligence, with being smart. Wisdom is focused on order. That is why creation themes pervade the wisdom literature. Wisdom is the perception of order, but it doesn't stop there. In wisdom, we are to pursue order, preserve it where we find it, promote it where it is obscure, procure it when it is on offer, and practice it at every opportunity. Wisdom results in a life well-lived, ordered, for godliness. The foundation of such wisdom, as scripture clearly tells us, is found in fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. God's wisdom is found in his creation and throughout all that he does. Our wisdom becomes evident and is realized when we take God seriously. True wisdom is not possible without God. For order cannot be found except as we recognize him as the center and source of it. What we call the fall came about when we determined to be like God by positioning ourselves as the center and source of wisdom and order rather than being like God as we subordinated ourselves to the order that he has established for us. Wisdom means that we want him to be the center with our lives ordered around him rather than ourselves being the center with everything ordered around us. 
including God. Creation is the result of wisdom and order flowing from God to make this universe what it is. God desires that we become the beneficiaries of his wisdom and become participants in his order. That is the path to relationship with him. Order results in what we sometimes call human flourishing. It involves resolving the unrest that threatens us in our world so that we find rest, the stability and security that we can strive to establish as co-workers with God who is its source. This flourishing also involves resolving fear that can so easily extend its tentacles into our lives so that we find shalom, the absence of fear, born of the trust we place in God. And thirdly, this flourishing involves resolving confusion that befuddles us in a complicated world in which we live so that we find coherence an understanding that comes when God is in his rightful place. God is the creator who in his wisdom has brought order into our world and our lives with the result that humans can flourish as they experience rest, the absence of unrest. Shalom, the absence of fear. And coherence, the absence of confusion. These are the gifts of God and his kingdom, now and forevermore. These are the objectives that God has addressed as creator. So why has God created? The Westminster Shorter Catechism is not actually answering that question, why God created, when it states that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Though that answer may often be used to explain why God created, but it really only answers the question, given that we are here, what is it that we are to do? Can we move to the next step and ask what God is doing? C.S. Lewis rightly observes, here note the mandatory Lewis quote for the Wheaton sermon rubric, <laughs> Conjectures as to why God does what he does are probably of no more value than my dog's ideas of what I'm up to when I sit and read. Trying to take our lead from the whole council of scripture, I would be inclined to suggest that while our chief end is glorifying God and enjoying him forever, his primary objective, I infer, is to be in relationship with us. How humbling. This is what God was setting up from the beginning, and it is what he has always, always wanted. Creation is an expression of what God has always wanted. Ultimate order is to be found in relationship with our creator. I would like us to get a sense of this by spending the next minutes thinking through scripture to find that common denominator of what God has always wanted. God's plan from the beginning was to create a people among whom he could dwell and with whom he could be in relationship. We should not suppose that he needed either a place to live or that he has some psychological need for companionship, as if it were not good for God to be alone. That's not the picture. His plan emerges naturally as an initiative that expresses his character as a creative, relational, and gracious being. This plan is reflected in the initial setting of Eden, where God's presence existed in what we might call a cosmic temple. And people were placed in the garden to be near him and to have the opportunity to come to know him. The plan was upset by the disobedience that we call the fall, by which sin entered the picture. Consequently, relationship with God was disrupted, and the privilege of being in the presence of God was forfeit as the first couple was driven out of the garden. 
The rest of the Bible is the account of God's program to restore his presence to his people and provide the means for them to be able to be in relationship with him again. Let's look at the stages of this penetration of God's presence. In Genesis 4.26, we are told that at the time of Seth, son of Adam and Eve, people began calling on the name of the Lord. This expression does not simply refer to making petitions. It indicates that they were invoking the presence of God. That's which had been lost. The greatest cost at the Garden of Eden was not the loss of paradise. It was the loss of God's presence. And they longed to have it back. In the account of the Tower of Babel, we find the people undertaking a project that endeavored to reestablish God's presence on earth. The tower was provided not so that people could go up, but as a means for God to come down and take up his residence in their city and be worshiped. Unfortunately, their concept of God was flawed. And when God came down, he was not pleased with the underlying premise of this initiative of theirs. Their intention was to reestablish sacred space and thereby gain favor with deity so that he would bless them. The result would be that their name would be great. In contrast, God's presence is supposed to be established so that his name would be exalted. God's counter-initiative is introduced in the next chapter of Genesis as he begins to form a covenant with Abram as a means by which he can reveal himself to the world. He chooses one family with whom he develops a relationship and among whom he will come to dwell. And this second stage then is the first step of the reclamation project. God's presence reaches a new level as he appears in the burning bush to Moses, reveals his name, his character, his nature, and the next step of his plan, deliverance of Israel from Egypt. His presence is made known through the plagues, the pillar of cloud and fire, settling on the top of Mount Sinai, where he reveals how his people can be in relationship with him, the law, and how they can preserve his presence the rituals and instructions regarding the tabernacle. In the next stage, God actually initiates a means by which his presence can be established on earth, first time since Eden, the tabernacle, a place of God's dwelling. And by keeping the law and observing rules of purity, people can enjoy relationship with God who has come among them. This stage of God's presence has extended eventually to the temple built by Solomon and lasts through the remainder of the Old Testament. A serious setback is suffered when the rebellion of the Israelites finally causes God's presence to leave the temple, allowing it to be destroyed. Covenant benefits are lost. Israelites exiled. Relationship with God hanging in the balance. Though they return to the land and the temple is rebuilt, the next stage of God's presence comes in the pages of the New Testament as God sends his son, Jesus, to be present, present in human flesh. Take up his residence, Emmanuel, God with us, as a sort of human tabernacle. It is through Christ that God's presence thus becomes available in a whole new way, and also through him that relationship is made available at a whole new level, with the penalty of sin being paid, the permanent mechanism for relationship being made available. Though Christ ascended to heaven after the resurrection, he had promised that his presence would not be taken from us, but that a comforter would be sent. Thus, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost marks the beginning of yet another stage in the availability of God's presence. Now within his people and a relationship based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost evidences a number of significant strides forward. All of this is the outflow of God's creative work that began in Genesis 1. So God, God's people become the location of God's presence, both individually and corporately. We are the temple. 
The final stage is yet to come. It is described in Revelation 21.3. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Consequently, we would conclude that the big picture from creation forward focuses on God's presence in this world, in the temple, in Christ, in us, through Christ in the spirit, and in new creation. It focuses on his presence and in, on being in relationship with God. We are saved not only from our sins, but into a relationship with God. And the importance of eternity is that the relationship we have with him will not be broken by death. The relationship is the goal. Salvation is the means. Eternity is the scope. And perhaps we should focus more on the goal and less on the means and the scope. In Genesis 1, creation is the story of God preparing a place for us so that he can be with us. That's the missing ingredient too often. Creation, revelation, and redemption are the major links in the story of relationship. And relationship is what God has always wanted. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are creator. And we thank you for all of that, all of what that means to us. As you have created a way for us to be in relationship with you. You have created a home for us with you. And we thank you that you are our creator. Help us not to lose sight of all of this as we worship you day by day in this marvelous place that you have made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.